Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the CDCR Board of Directors and staff, I'd like to welcome you to this month's installment of the 17th Annual Reshaping Rochester Lecture Series. My name is Monica Reifenstein, and I'm the Interim Executive Director of the Design Center. This year's theme is the ideal city. Each year through our lecture series, we aim to open dialogue around issues of uh, in urban planning, design strategies, and equity that contribute to the revitalization of our region. We continue to be interested in how we can promote inclusion and equity through the way we think about and create space. Over the course of the series this year, we're discussing what it means to be ideal, exploring cities and communities that would be categorized as ideal, and asking if and how our own community could become ideal. The Community Design Center of Rochester was founded in 2003, and we are celebrating nearly two decades of surveys in the greater Rochester region. At the Design Center, we promote the creation of vibrant, equitable, and resilient communities by engaging, educating, and empowering stakeholders in crafting purposeful design. I'd like to take this time to introduce you to our board members, starting with our executive committee. We have Monica McCullough, Bill Price, Stephanie Annunziata, and Vanessa Villeneuve. Moving on to our at-large members, we have Howard Decker, Jean Dupre, Eugenio Marlin, Michael Pratico, Miriam Jacob, and Tanya Zweilin. I thank you all for your commitment, guidance, and support. If you've been following our organizational updates, you know that we are currently looking for our next permanent executive director. That application window is still open, so please continue to share this news within your networks. You're welcome to reach out to myself or our board president, Monica McCullough, with any questions. I'd like to recognize and thank the New York State Council on the Arts, who has made our work possible through their generous support for nearly two decades. Thank you. And we also greatly appreciate the support of individuals in our community. Our circle of friends is made up of people and businesses who have donated $500 or more to our organization for operational support. A big thank you goes out to everyone on this list and I extend an invitation to any of you who value the work of the Design Center to please join our circle. We gratefully acknowledge the ESL Charitable Foundation for their sustaining generosity and support of the series at the gold level this year as well as the RACF, the Community Foundation, for their support as a Silver Level sponsor. Special thanks goes out to today's event sponsor, Hanlon Architects, as well as the event sponsors for the remainder of our series, RG&E, Hevron and Company, the Community Preservation Corporation, Labella Associates, and Berkman. Special thanks to our exclusive media sponsor, WXXI, as well as AIA Rochester for providing our continuing education credits. And finally, thank you to Hedonist Artisan Chocolates for providing some tasty, tasty treats for all of our speakers this year. We truly appreciate all of our supporting sponsors and lecture series friends. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without you. So a big thank you to everyone on the screen. And I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to also recognize uh, those behind the scenes who make, make our series possible, including our lecture committee. Uh, everyone's names are up on the screen there for you, as well as Trisha and Kelly at Marshall Partners. Thank you all. And please don't forget to take our survey at the end of the presentation. It will be popping up directly on your screen so you can't miss it. Uh, your feedback is incredibly helpful in planning future programs. This presentation has been approved for both AICP CM credits and AIA HSW credits. The following slides are for anyone who would like to receive those professional development credits. And those folks should click through to the Google Doc that I'll be posting in the chat to log their attendance today. Here's all the AICP information. And here's the information for AIA credits today. This is a brief description of the course content. 
And these are the learning objectives resulting from today's program. I would like to note that ASLA credits are also available uh, most likely for this presentation. Uh, typically, historically, uh, ASLA has accepted AIA credits as long as the topic is relevant to landscape architecture. So you folks are also welcome to sign in on the sign-in sheet. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's featured speaker, Dr. Samina Raja. Dr. Raja is a professor of urban and regional planning and the associate dean for research and inclusive excellence at the University at Buffalo. Trained in civil engineering and urban planning, Dr. Raja's research focuses on the potential of community-led planning and policy to create equitable and healthy communities. She is the founder and director of the Food Systems Planning and Healthy Communities Lab and co-directs the Community for Global Health Equity at UB. With community and academic partners, she currently leads an action research initiative called Growing Food Policy from the Ground Up, which builds the capacity of growers of color to shape urban agriculture policy in Buffalo, New York and Minneapolis, Minnesota. A larger national scale project, Growing Food Connections, focuses on the use of local government planning to strengthen community food systems. Her work outside of the US highlights the ways in which smallholder urban farmers in the global south promote food sovereignty, particularly in cities experiencing protracted crises such as Srinagar, Kashmir. Most recently, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN published her and her co-authors monograph that offers guidance on the role of local government planning in strengthening food systems in low and middle income countries. A widely published scholar, Dr. Raja is the recipient of numerous awards, including for her mentorship, community engaged work, and scholarship. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Samina Raja as she takes us through a presentation called Food Equity by Design. Thank you for the welcome, Monica. Please give me a minute as I turn on my slides using screen share. I am delighted to join the Community Design Center of Rochester for this conversation about an ideal city. It is too often that our imagination is limited and we never get to the conversation about an ideal city. So when I was asked to speak in this series, I was especially thrilled because too much of the conversation, not just in our cities in the United States, but also globally, seems to be wrestling with challenges, but not aspirations. So um, I am personally and professionally excited to be with all of you in our neighboring city of Rochester to be engaged in this conversation. I'll begin by saying that if you remember nothing about my comments, remember this, that to be an ideal city, we simply have to co-design. In order to have an equitable food environment, in order to have an ideal city, we simply need to co-design. That said, I will begin first by offering gratitude. My comments today in the time that I have with you uh, would not be possible really but for the work and leadership of colleagues in the city of Rochester who, as I have learned, have done an extraordinary amount of work to build an equitable food system in the city of Rochester. I am grateful to Food Future Western New York, which is a nine county initiative that is attempting to draw attention to food systems in cities in Western New York, including in Rochester. And then of course, Community Design Center for organizing uh, this conversation today. I also thank everybody who has taken the time out on this beautiful sunny day to join this conversation. Um, that is a joke only for people in Western New York. Uh, the work that I'm sharing today is of course designed for this series but builds on work that has been funded by the Foundation of Food and Agricultural Research and many other partners that make this work possible. Knowledge, like cities, is never produced alone. The work that I'm going to show you today 
is really the result of an outstanding team at the UB Food Lab, which you heard a little about from Monica. The UB Food Lab team, this is the current team, but many of our alums are actually native to Rochester as well. Uh, we are an interdisciplinary team that includes engineers, planners, people focusing on geographic information systems. Today's work in particular was supported by Nathaniel Mitch, who is in fact from Rochester, Lorna George, who is an undergraduate student in environmental design, and Leah Rachel Chandy, who's an architect but has left the lab and her picture is not on the slide, and Eric Hughes, who contributed to a lot of the understanding of spatial conditions in the city of Rochester in preparation for this talk. Thank you everybody for making this possible. I have a short amount of time, middle of the day. I'm gonna focus on a four part presentation and leave room for conversation. First, I wanna make sure that colleagues who are dialing in and I speak the same language about what does it mean to have a community food infrastructure. There are lots of conversations about food that are happening around the country, around the globe, but are we really talking about the same thing? I'd like to draw attention to food, that infrastructure that makes food possible in our cities. Part two of my comments will be no surprise to many of you on this call. One of the joys of being somebody who visits a community, virtually in this case, is to simply lift up what works in a community. It has been a great pleasure to learn about the work in Rochester, and I do say great pleasure uh, from an informed place because I compare what is happening in Rochester to work that is happening nationally, but also globally. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about co-designing equitable infrastructure and leave us with some tactics for a way forward and hopefully leave you enough um, maybe with questions so that we can engage in a conversation at the end. So with that, I will get started. I purposely use the phrase community food infrastructure because until and unless we recognize communities food infrastructure as that, an infrastructure that makes everything else possible, we're not going to be able to tackle the concerns and aspirations that I suspect many of you have been already talking about. As long as we keep talking about the presence or absence of a grocery store and stop there, then we will continue to battle with upstream factors. We need to be able to understand community food infrastructure the same way that architects or planners might understand other kinds of infrastructure. Knowing that I likely have architect colleagues and designer colleagues on this talk, I'll point out some comparable examples. You wouldn't really think about a house, for example, without all the pieces, the utilities that would go into that superstructure. You wouldn't be designing and planning a city without think thinking about the sewer infrastructure. Sewers and water pipelines move water and waste. In a similar way, in order for food to be available to people, then we need to be thinking about the back and community food infrastructure that makes it possible. Uh, so let me go in that direction. So people and cities exist and thrive because of this food infrastructure. On the top right of your slide, you can see that I am arguing the first task ahead of us in order to design for food equity is actually to make this infrastructure visible. It exists, but most of us don't know that it exists. That food infrastructure, of course, starts with the soil, with the farmers who grow the food we eat. It goes on to the aggregators that gather from those farms and make it possible that for that food to be collected. Um, none of us really want to eat only carrots. We want to eat carrots and spinach and other things together. And there are aggregators who do that for us. Um, I'm told that some of us don't like to eat raw things. We want to eat value added vegetables. If my daughter is any evidence, she'll insist that it's all about the Cheetos. But Cheetos aside, we do need food processing to move the raw food forward to each of us as consumers. From the processors that food moves to, 
the way in which most of us on this call enjoy food, which is through retail. Food also moves to us ultimately because we spend our money, we go purchase that food. We also might, uh, Buffalo and Rochester share this passion for restaurants, we might obtain that food at what is called food service sector. And then a large part of our food infrastructure is also all those large institutions that serve people food by virtue of membership or some other form. For example, the university at Buffalo feeds all its undergraduate students and our campus and dining is always looking for chicken wings. Apparently they're a thing among our undergrads in Buffalo. Um, so all of that is the food infrastructure. There is a food infrastructure that makes all of that possible. Along all of this, what you see in gray is all the inputs, the energy, the mobility that makes that food move around cities. Simultaneously, the food system or the food infrastructure also has outputs. One very obvious one that I suspect many of you think about is the waste that is generated at all stages of the food system. Waste uh, is generated because people discard the food, but food is also lost in the food infrastructure because it's not picked up at the farms. It may be lost in the grocery store. There's a lot of food loss that happens in the food infrastructure. All of this seems fairly straightforward, but what is perhaps hidden is that this infrastructure is a set of power relationships. It is a set of uh, monetary relationships. There are winners and losers in the food system. There are people who are marginalized and people who profit. Um, so not only is it important to make the food system visible, it is also important to make it equitable. And by that, I mean that people who are marginalized in the food infrastructure, our city's food infrastructure, they are well positioned, better than most, to articulate its challenges and therefore to design the solutions. So to give you a very concrete example, uh, there is nobody better positioned than a single parent in a city to tell you how hard it is to ride public transit in order to do grocery shopping. Uh, there is nobody better positioned than a farmer, a small scale farmer, better positioned to tell you how challenging it is to meet tax costs, energy costs in order to run a business. Both consumers and farmers, low income consumers and small scale farmers are frankly marginalized in the US food system, but also in our urban food systems. And they ought to be driving how we understand food infrastructure and what the appropriate solutions are. So we need to make it equitable. How do we do that? This is the second part of what I'm going to share is it's crucial that we build on what works. We build on what already works in the city of Rochester. And I signaled this at the beginning of my comments. It has been an absolute pleasure to look at the work that has been done not just recently, but there's a whole history of work in the city of Rochester around food and food equity as well. And um, unfortunately, I won't have time to detail all of it, but I do think that one of my goals is to bring to the audience of design and architecture and planning types and those who maybe don't touch food work as closely to draw your attention to the assets you already have in your community. Uh, so to do that, I want to first say uh, gratitude to the partners who helped me understand this, including many of whom whose work is featured in the next set of slides. Um, you have in the city of Rochester Taproot Collective, which is an urban agriculture collective uh, that is led by Leslie Knox and which operates an urban farm in the city partners with all kinds of uh, entities, provides resources. What is important about this food production that is happening is that the key word that I took away, and I'm not embedded in the collective, is the very idea of collective, that the intent is to not only serve its own organization, but to lift up and collaborate with the larger city. So you have within the city of uh, Rochester, an agricultural collective that is well positioned and doing this work, 
redesigning, frankly, Rochester to be a more equitable food environment. This is part of your infrastructure. Uh, similarly, I learned that faith-based organizations in the city of Rochester, for example, St. Mark's and St. John's Episcopal Church run community gardens um, in the city, which is a tactical use of both trying to engage with the faith-based community, but also providing building capacity in the city, connecting resident, with residents through urban agriculture and revitalizing their own parish. You have, in addition to food production, keep in mind the infrastructure that I shared with you, perhaps um, some uh, piece of infrastructure that I will freely admit that I'm incredibly jealous of as a Buffalonian, but also as somebody who studies food infrastructure nationally. Your public market in the city of Rochester that I just learned is among one of the markets in the country that has the highest amount of supplemental nutrition assistance program sales. And this work, the historic work on this, really comes from Mitch Gruber, who is part of uh, Food Links in Rochester. This infrastructure is not new. It is publicly owned and operated, but you have to, I have to, we all have to understand it in the context of the larger food system. It's not a single entity by itself, but it's part of a larger ecology. And of course, I already signaled Food Link when I mentioned Mitch, but Food Link, again, is an example of a piece of that ecology, that infrastructure, uh, in theory, a food bank, but the more I learn about them, I look at all the pieces of the food system that they are trying to stitch together with a cafe, a curbside market, urban farm education programming, I'm often um, nationally thinking about, for those of you who don't think about food banks too much, food banks are often understood as an emergency stop gap measure. And while food bank, uh, food link certainly does that, but food link also thinks about the root causes of food insecurity or food inequity in Rochester, which is an important shift for food banks nationally and kudos to food link for doing that. So I use all of those examples to simply showcase elements of your Rochester community food infrastructure. You have growers, you have processors such as the commissary, which is both publicly supported, but also an opportunity to fit into that large ecosystem to connect the growers to the retailers and to the consumers. You have at the same time Food Link that is providing fresh food and also running the cafe. And you have an entity called Flower City Pickers that is reclaiming food waste from the market and making sure that it is recovered for good use, both for consumer use but also for composting. All of those examples, I hope, signal for all of you that you have really frankly from an outside perspective, the makings of a full community city food infrastructure. The reason it's important to begin there is because in order for any suggestions that I might make, you would have to build on what is already working. And for that, you have an entity that is prepared to do that, and that is for those who are not familiar, the Rochester Food Policy Council. Rochester Food Policy Council is an entity that is specifically designed to think about that ecosystem. It's fairly new. Um, I'm delighted that one of my colleagues in the Food Lab is actually a member of the Rochester Food Policy Council, and I've had the pleasure of working and listening to Rosa Luciano, who is leading the Rochester Food Policy Council, uh, which is really focused on thinking about that ecosystem of how do we make, how do you all make folks dialing in from Rochester a more equitable food system in the city of Rochester. In other words, all the elements of your city food infrastructure are very much present. So where do we go in a setting where you have all the pieces and how do we push towards equity? In order to do that, uh, Rochester is not alone in this. 
In cities around the United States, and I will dive into some examples shortly, you have excellent work happening in each sector. As you can imagine, on the left side of your screen, you have all the components of what I call the community food infrastructure in the beginning. But what is also happening is that food system is operating in this landscape of governance, plans, policies, regulations, finance, uh, all of these elements that impact how well a food system can work in a coordinated fashion or not. And of course, you need physical infrastructure. I'm gonna pause here because really, this might be the most important message around designing for equity. As long as we keep focusing on one piece of the food system, we fail to see where inequities are embedded and where they generate from. And then we keep tinkering at the margins to point out sometimes regrettably that people don't eat, make healthy eating choices. Sure, they may not. I may not have made healthy eating choices, but it's important to reveal that those healthy eating choices happen within the context of a larger ecosystem of the food infrastructure, which itself works against this landscape of governance plans, regulations, public finance, and physical infrastructure. I was told that every time I start talking about zoning, only three planners on the talk get excited besides me, but bear with me. I promise that I will make sure that this is um, appealing or it makes sense as we move forward. In order to build equitable food infrastructure, you already have in the city of Rochester, folks that are doing amazing work. I've just showcased really only a handful. There are so many more. In order for them to be successful, in order for them to design an equitable food infrastructure for the city, collectively, it is necessary to see this ecosystem and see how the larger structure, policy structure, governance, plans, policies, regulations, public incentives, and physical infrastructure impacts how well this food system works or not, how well the food infrastructure works or not. And I'm gonna give you examples of what that might look like. First, I'm gonna give you what might be tedious examples. Uh, so for example, people who are dialing in as planners are very familiar with land use plans, transportation plans, economic development plans. City of Rochester has an outstanding comprehensive plan. I just had a chance to review it. Um, all of these plans, in fact, impact the food infrastructure that I described earlier. Land use decisions impact it. Every time land is protected here and developed here and people are dispossessed through gentrification, we are making a decision about who can grow and eat food. That is one example. Zoning decisions, licensing, permits, landscape impact the business of processors. They impact the business of retail. They impact how well somebody can start a food business. All of those factors impact the food infrastructure. Public finance too impacts food infrastructure that I showed you previously. Public finance, I always make a point of talking both expenditures and revenues. City governments around the United States on behalf of the public expend funds. They have operating expenditures, they have capital expenditures, they issue bonds. These expenditures don't publicly acknowledge the food infrastructure in a city. They do acknowledge uh, police or public safety, the misnomer public safety. But why is it that the greatest expenditure, operating expenditure, often happens to be public works and quote unquote public safety, but not the food system? No reason for it to not be the other way around. Similarly, city governments also accrue revenues. They charge property taxes, fees, fines, all of those revenues also impact the food infrastructure. Regrettably, much of the revenue structure in the United States is really focused on high-end economic development, not necessarily for lifting up the infrastructure that would actually make cities healthy and equitable and in the long run would have a positive economic impact. In Erie County, where I'm physically located, more than 10% of our GDP is actually in the aggregate food system ecosphere. But 
because it's not on the radar of many cities and governments, we tend not to budget for them. We tend not to understand the impact and interface between public finance and the food system. The last piece is physical infrastructure. Obviously, we use roads to transport food. You have public markets. You have the best one possibly in the country. Water infrastructure, crucial for growing, waste management linked to the food system. One of the biggest, if not the biggest, but a significant contributor of waste um, in cities is actually food related waste, not, not just the organic waste, but also packaging. So you need physical infrastructure to do all of that. And we, we meaning city governments, urban planners, architect types, less so, are already enacting plans, policies, regulations, making public finance decisions, enacting public physical infrastructure that impacts the food system, but we don't actively think about the food system. So when I talk to city planners, I just had a conversation with somebody at the state level and they said to me they don't do food policy and I gently reminded them that everything that they do is in fact food policy. We may not see it that way. So you will notice that the left column on governance, I left blank and that is intentional. The reason food is invisible in city governments and in cities is partly because invisible and inequitable is because we don't have the appropriate governance mechanisms for dealing with community food infrastructure. So we don't have departments of city, departments of food. Some cities do have them, but uh, we don't, it's not a mainstream thing. Uh, fortunately, in your case, you do have a comprehensive plan that explicitly calls for food throughout the plan. Congratulations to all of you who worked on that. Uh, compared to Buffalo, Rochester's plan is outstanding in its treatment of food related issues. Uh, the challenge will be to actually implement it. Uh, so we need to fix the governance and we need to figure out how to implement the comp plan in your city in order to move towards equity. So quickly, let me give some examples of what that might look like. On the governance side, you already have a food policy council. Do you have food equity advisors? Is there a food justice director? City of Boston just announced a food justice director. Rochester seems very well positioned to move forward on a food equity action plan and then doing progress reports on where the current plan is. It is also important to look at the current policies, regulations and laws to make sure that equity and flexibility is front and center. In a recent piece, uh, colleagues and I wrote that the tendency of cities is to regulate, not incentivize. That means that city governments are more busy telling what you can and cannot do rather than lift up and make it possible to do good work. Uh, on the public finance side, it's important to reimagine public finance just the way you are talking about an ideal city. What does equitable and ideal development funds look like? Finally, you have to start linking all the physical infrastructure to the kinds of infrastructure that Taproot Collective needs, Food Link needs, other commissary needs, other partners in the city of Rochester need. So um, I am going to move somewhat rapidly to give you examples from around the country so that we can leave time for conversation. So the ask was to imagine the ideal city and after reflecting on it for a bit, I have to say that I am not sure that I can point to that. I'm not even sure that that is where I would put my focus on. Uh, because an ideal in my head um, might run the risk of making conditions stagnant. So inequity or challenges are something that are dynamic. 10 years ago, there was a different challenge. 10 years from now, there will be a different challenge. So I am suggesting and looking at examples from around the country brought to you by the Food Lab um, are partly because of how cities can strive to be ideal rather than be an ideal. So you are going to see now some of those examples. As I go through the examples, I just want to point out that the examples are not going to be for one thing, like a lease allowing use of public land is not just land, nor is it just lease. Many of the ways that cities around the country are doing this work 
is by combining that um, matrix that I showed. So as I go through the examples, I'm not going to talk about one specific policy or one specific public finance tactic, but that um, cities that are striving to be ideal are really working hard to look at a complex set of offerings to nudge towards a more equitable food infrastructure. So that's what you're going to see. One example is the city of Baltimore. In the city of Baltimore, which by the way, is also one of the cities um, that has a department dedicated to food work and had, I think, one of the country's first food policy director um, who shepherded a lot of this work, um, Holly Freistadt. The city provides five-year leases on city-owned land for urban farming. So they are providing the physical infrastructure. They're also easing off regulations. Community gardens don't need a permit for hoop houses and they're creating flexibility. So there is no number or square footage limit on greenhouses. And then they're incentivizing. They're providing property tax credit for grocery stores that open in uh, neighborhoods that have poor food environments. So land use, taxes, permitting policy all combined together makes Baltimore, um, it signals that Baltimore is striving towards um, an ideal city. Moving to a different part of the country, one of the um, my observations is that change when it happens in the food system somehow again overlooks the leadership of black-led and brown-led organizations in cities. I The example that I chose to highlight for you is from the city of Seattle, because the city of Seattle has a long history of food work. The one that I was struck by is that the city has funded infrastructure for food innovation center led by its black led organization that is specifically targeting neighborhoods that are at the risk of gentrification. Not only are they building a food infrastructure, but they are explicitly thinking, how are we wrestling with the question of equity? So this particular innovation district is uh, in early phases. So I invite you to look at it as an example. It's their shift, I would say, to thinking about equity and they're not there. And uh, if I was talking to colleagues from Seattle, I would say that they could do a lot more because of the size of their budget and the wealth in the city. That said, um, Seattle is also an example of the longest standing community gardening program in the United States. Uh, they have more than 30 acres of public land and community gardens through a program called Pea Patch. What is important to note for folks dialing in from Rochester is that Pea Patch is actually run by city government. So just the way we recognize city government as running public works, we recognize city government as running housing programs, Seattle city government actually runs the Pea Patch community gardening program. Um, the other example, uh, people don't think about Kansas City when they think about innovation, but in fact, a remarkable project there that is supported by city government is a refugee farm incubator, again, on city-owned land um, that provides access to land, storage, training, and this is a partnership between the government and a not-for-profit that provides training to refugees. Um, closer to home because in the you know in western new york we like examples from cleveland uh, we have city government uh, cleveland has a long legacy of setting them in motion lots of food related policies they provide funding for urban farming entrepreneurs and cash they have a purchasing ordinance that provides uh, that privileges local supplies uh, local suppliers. And then, of course, they also provide subsidized water rates based on use by growers, all of them tackling funding ordinances and resources for production. Within our own state, New York City, is perhaps this example might be relevant for folks who are uh, developers, builders in the architecture world, should know about food retail expansion program in New York City that provides a whole suite of um, benefits, incentives to developers in order to build fresh food retail in areas that have gaps. So for example, they might get abatement, they might get reduced 
filing fees, um, and we can talk about the details of this program. And um, they have been successful in completing 22 projects that are tied to food retail. Uh, one of my favorites, because I've followed the history of this project uh, for probably too long. Uh, I've followed this project since the 1990s, late 1990s is a piece of land in prime real estate area, 31 acre land that used to be owned by state of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin, which those of you who might know is a hot real estate market. And this piece of land was a contested space. Residents wanted community food infrastructure. They had already been using it for that. And the planning department had a different vision, traditional planning, put some housing in, do your usual subdivision development. I'm going to truncate that multi-year story to tell you today in this location of what was that 31 acre land owned by the state. Uh, you now have a parcel, a development project uh, that has 30 affordable housing units within a land trust and urban farm nested within the site. You have more than 300 community gardening lots. You have woodlands, prairie, educational programming. And it came together because of a really creative arrangement between an open land, open space land trust, a housing land trust, and the city um, community development block grant worked together to make this possible. Um, the drawing is an old one uh, before it actually existed, but it is there and functional and incredibly uh, an incredibly beautiful example of how housing ought not to be pitted against food. So we are coming to the tail end of my comments. Um, I'm going to talk about way forward and they are really in some ways cautionary notes. And some of this is simply, uh, I suspect familiar, but it must be said. Think that especially for architects, planners and folks in the design discipline, um, I think the venue in which I'm speaking, this is not going to be that surprising, that when you co-design with community, you are more likely to ensure an asset-based frame to designing food systems. Because people know what works in their community, and they also know what the challenges are. When you are not from the community, there is a tendency to gloss over the assets and focus on the challenges which leads us to problematic solutions. Part of that is related to our failure to understand history. So conditions in Rochester, like conditions in Buffalo, in the food retail environment, to use that one little piece as an example, are really tied to historic patterns of redlining. So in the city of Buffalo, in the predominantly African-American neighborhood, we had maps that discouraged investments. And my understanding is that it's the same in Rochester. Those neighborhoods, even today, struggle to draw investment. So if we don't understand what led to that condition, we might incorrectly diagnose today's condition as something else. So one of the phrases that I discourage people from uh, using is the idea of this that I will not actually say because a linguist told me if you will say it, it will stick in people's memory. So it's on your slide, but I'm not gonna say it. But what you are seeing is historic food related apartheid that is creating current conditions. In order to move forward, we have to understand that past. The third piece, especially for, I suspect some of the colleagues on the call here is that place-based equity-centered investments can address causes, not only symptoms. So on the slide, uh, this is not going to be surprising to colleagues on this call. The darker areas are the areas that are most impacted by underinvestment. These are areas where households are in poverty, they have limited access to vehicles, and then the dotted area is the coverage by whatever kind of store is present in their neighborhood. So if we are going to want to change conditions, we cannot simply advocate for the arrival of a store in the gap areas. So let me pause. To change conditions, 
we have to be able to build the purchasing power of people in the purple areas and we have to change what is available in their communities. So place-based equity-centered investments suggests that we have to do both. It can be one or the other. Then finally, if, I know that folks in Rochester has, have been doing this for many, many years, and certainly that's true in Buffalo as well. If we keep doing the same thing over and over again, and we don't see change in the food system, then it suggests that we need to revisit what we know about that condition. So my encouragement, uh, both in Buffalo, but also other places, is to really understand many forms of evidence. Understand lived experience in those neighborhoods when we design food systems, understand stories, understand numbers, understand visuals, because the reality of food-related experience, the reality of businesses, is really tied to all of those different ways of knowing and experiencing the food system. So that said, I am really delighted to share that you all are the first group that we are um, announcing the availability of a data portal. It's a soft launch. The bit.ly is on your screen. Um, this is made possible by a regional effort that is aiming to improve the food infrastructure regionally. And of course, Rochester is a key part of that effort. You will find on this data portal information about farmers, information about processors, um, information about people related questions and needs. Um, and we definitely we fully believe in co-designing this portal. So there is a place for people to submit their own stories. And of course, please let us know if information or data is off and we would be happy to fix it. So finally, to conclude, in order to build an equitable food system, governance has to be equitable. Plans have to be intersectoral across the food system. Policies, regulations, and laws have to lift up. They have to amplify the food system. Public finance has to invest and incentivize. And then finally, food infrastructure, just like roads, just like utilities, has to be understood as a public infrastructure. Please learn and engage with colleagues who are already doing food work in the city of Rochester. Measure progress. The comprehensive plan is a great starting place. Find out how the city is making progress. Advocate and reset. And I look forward to working and learning alongside all of you. Uh, Buffalo has a lot to learn from Rochester, and I look forward to being in that journey with you. Thank you. Back to you, Monica. Thank you, Dr. Raja. I'm gonna invite our lecture committee chair, Bill Price, to hop on to moderate our Q&A. Thank you. Dr. Raja, thank you very much. And uh, I can see this was a, a topic of great interest to a lot of the people uh, just kind of watching the chat happening. And uh, I'm sure we'll get some Q&A uh, in, the, in the column and you and I can kind of keep an eye on that. Um, I'd like to start our conversation. Uh, you and I did have a, a brief opportunity to speak before this lecture and there are so many issues involved with it. And I know there was no way for you in 45 minutes to be able to really hit on, on everything, but you certainly hit on all the, the, big, the big topics. And uh, I, I'll start by, by asking a kind of a, I hope it's a simple one, but if our food distribution system was, I, I guess, if the retailers chose to locate in every community, in every neighborhood, regardless, you know, just really basing their locations on density of population, uh, nothing to do with economics or any of the, the, the kind of the redlining tactics, uh, would we even be having this, this conversation? If, if the retail system chose to locate in, in all of our communities, in all of our neighborhoods? It's a good question, Bill. Um, we would be having a different conversation. Mm -hmm. We would still be having a conversation. 
um, there are other cities around the globe where there is food retail present in every neighborhood. It looks very different than the United States. So we have uh, Mitch Gruber can tell you a lot more about this than I can. There is a heavy concentration of food retail. It's consolidated into few large supermarkets. That's part of the explanation, but I really do think that redlining is a big part of it even today. Um, but if we did have retail in every neighborhood, that would fix part of the problem. Remember in my purple slide diagram, I said even if we had food retail in every neighborhood, we would still need to have a condition where people have the economic resources to participate in that retail. That is not the case right now. So we are a country where the disparity, economic disparity is quite significant. So you don't have the income to actually purchase. So I would say we would have, if we were able to do that, and that would be fantastic, we would fix one problem. The second problem that would have to be addressed would be how do we bring economic parity among our residents so that they can participate in that retail system. If I could say one more thing about that, um, a lot of the projects that are being funded under the name of fresh food retail, I don't see them explicitly tying those public benefits to hiring of residents in those neighborhoods. So if one were to design the arrival of fresh food retail in neighborhoods, I think it behooves policymakers and designers to think about how do we make it both a place-based strategy and a people-based strategy at the same time. So if a retailer receives tax benefits, are they really providing workforce development and are they hiring people from those neighborhoods? More importantly, um, if we are not supporting entrepreneurship from those neighborhoods, we are also missing the boat. So an example from the city of Buffalo that I can give, I mentioned that we have had redlining by food retail in the east side of Buffalo, which is our predominantly black neighborhood. We have a uh, black led African American food um, heritage food co-op that understands that it's not only about food that is using a cooperative economic model to both bring food, but also to invest economically in the community. We need a combination of those tools in order to lift both the food system and the people. We have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask from our attendees. Uh, Elizabeth Henderson asks, uh, are there any cities that offer five year or any really any term, I guess, uh, rolling leases to urban farmers? Um, hello, Elizabeth, lovely to have you here. Um, fortunately, the lab team has already answered the question in the chat. So Nathaniel Mitch has clarified that Baltimore lease isn't rolling, but it requires an 18 month waiting period. Um, I have not seen a rolling lease, um, Elizabeth, but I will do some digging around and I will follow up on that. But I'm not seeing that directly. Okay. Um... Let's see, under Q&A, we had one other question from Abby. I'm assuming it's Abby, sorry if I'm wrong. Uh, how can or should we integrate efforts to develop an equitable regional food system and efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and address the effects of climate change? Mm. Great question. Uh, doctor, would you see you see the act of of farming, whether it's uh, traditional rural or uh, urban farming? Uh, I know there's there is infrastructure and there are operational issues, but does farming in in general offer you know carbon sequestration opportunities uh, just by expanding the the area? Of uh, food production, uh, does, does that just inherently help our, our climate change strategies? Good question. 
So uh, to be clear, my area of work is not on climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, so I'm cautious about giving uh, prescriptive answers to this. That said, um, I do think that the food system has a significant impact on climate. And um, currently, it's not the best impact. If we are going to have an impact, mitigate the effects of climate change, food system is one mechanism to do that. I'm sure many people have heard that currently we're using a lot of fossil fuel to try, you know, move food from one place to another. But that's a, only one way the food system impacts um, emissions. Because in some ways, the way we do local production can also impact emissions. Um, sequestration is one method that people are trying. But I would say that every region and every community has to develop its own way of building a climate sensitive food system. And certainly Western New York and Rochester Monroe County has the potential of doing that. Uh, to answer Abigail's question, I would say that there are efforts that are already happening and I'm happy to share a resource. Maybe somebody from the lab will drop this in the chat. Uh, colleagues of mine and I just finished, uh, just announced a publication called Planning for the View Shed. So for designers, architects, you understand the term view shed, but we really need to be planning food energy watersheds together because each of those are impacting climate change. Each of those have impact on emissions, but each of them are being planned in silos. So one way to answer Abigail's question is that we need to have the right partners in the room. We need to have the climate advocates and we need to have the environmental planners in the same room as those that are doing energy planning as well as food system planning. So my short answer to that question is absolutely yes. And if we do regional work, we're better going to be able to impact that because um, we, are not, we don't have the capacity to 100% grow all our food for a city within city confines. So we do need to look at our regional footprint. And in order to do that, we need to first start the process of planning that. Maybe I can request um, somebody to drop a link. Okay, perfect. Maybe Nathaniel can drop a link to the, uh, it's already in the chat. You can pull that up and that might give some more examples. I do wanna give one municipal example, um, which struck with me, Bill, as you were asking. Um, I know of a municipality in Canada that encourages its beef farmers, ranchers, to engage in sustainable practices. And uh, they monitor the water that enters the ranch, and then they monitor the water that leaves the ranch. And this particular rancher engages in a lot of sustainability practices. So they do a lot of deep root planting. Uh, they do some crop rotation. I don't remember all of their practices. But the end result is that when water leaves their ranch, it's actually cleaner than when it enters. And so they get a benefit from the municipality for providing a service to the ecosystem. So we, in order to do what Abigail is saying and Bill, what you are saying, I think we need public incentives and course corrections to help farmers engage in that. Farmers are not making a lot of money in the United States right now. It's tough to be a farmer. Then expecting them to also suddenly be responsible for mitigating greenhouse gas emissions um, is going to be challenging, especially for the farmers that grow our fruits and vegetables. Um, yep, somebody in the chat said payment for ecosystem services. Exactly. Um, not my area of work, but I think Rochester, maybe Monroe County, I hope Monroe County planners are on the call. Maybe they can experiment with it. Back to you, Bill. Thanks. I, I um, have a couple other questions here. Uh, Lucas Barber asks, what type of work should be avoided and what opportunities offer the best bang for the buck? Sorry, you cut out there a little. Oh, okay. 
Oh. The, the question is, uh, what type of work should be avoided and what opportunities offer the biggest or the best bang for your buck? It's the perfect question for an academic. It's general enough yeah. to take it in any direction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lucas. Yeah. Um, I would say because of my um, recommendation that we understand the food system, I would say any type of work that works at cross purpose within the food system should be avoided. So what's not working with the food system right now is that there's inequity. Low income people of color, consumers are being shafted, farmers are being shafted. So we should really be avoiding any kind of investment or tactic that continues to uh, foster that behavior. So then the flip side is what opportunities offer the best bank for our buck? I would say in the city of Rochester, just I presume this is question is coming from Rochester. You have so many excellent projects that are happening in each part of the food system that you may really benefit from a few things. And I'm going to uh, mention these. One is better coordination which requires investment. And that investment, I would argue, should come from the public, from the municipal government or county government, because city and county cannot be the farmers, but they are the convening space, so coordination. The Food Policy Council is part of that. Um, it needs to have money for the coordination. It requires effort and time and money to convene and gather. Uh, so coordination would be one. Uh, I will say right now that coordination is likely happening on the backs of low income black and brown folks because they are, they can't help but coordinate and collectively act. So we need to make that work visible, invest in coordination. That's one. The second is to invest in capacity building. And by that, I mean, there are programs that will pay for community gardening programs or they will pay for education programs. But how are how is their investment going into capacity building, into helping organizations get ready for execution of those programs? Is Taproot Collective, is Food Link, are uh, flower pickers receiving funds to do capacity building? I don't know. I would suggest that that's really important. And then the third is you have land. That land should be utilized right now to shore up the food system. Um, through urban food production, but I also noticed the gap in composting. So flower pickers are working with the public market. Um, is there compost being collected somewhere in the city? If yes, is it being provided to urban growers? That is one example, but what that signals is any projects, any initiatives that are systemic, that are intersectoral, those are your opportunities for whatever limited funds you have. Doctor, I, I, there's there are a couple of questions here. I do have one one for you. I, I think uh, a lot of your organization's work is in the urban environments, and I would like to just step out to maybe the suburban kind of ring communities that have a lot of housing or commercial or some industrial, and then we transition to the rural lands, and we have plenty of examples here as you do in the in the Buffalo area.
Thank you again, Dr. Raja. Uh, this has been so informative. I mean, I'm sure you could see everything happening in the chat, very active, uh, wonderfully engaging uh, presentation. And just thank you so much for all of that information. You are a wealth of knowledge. Um, I would like to invite all of you on the call to please join us again next week for our follow-up conversation. Uh, we will be featuring Taproot Collective's Leslie Knox, who was mentioned earlier in the program, as well as Common Ground Health's Mike Bulger, who is on the call with us today. Um, we will continue to discuss these ideas and strategies from the presentation today. That'll be uh, one week from today on Zoom at noon. And we hope that you will join us again in May as we continue to explore the ideal city. Uh, so that lecture will be featuring Luis Aguirre Torres, and he will be speaking about how we can decarbonize cities. He's currently the Director of Sustainability for the city of Ithaca. And final reminder to please respond to our survey, Your Opinion Counts. We do look at all of those responses and they impact all of the programming that we bring you. And with that, we are officially at the end of our program. I thank you all again for joining us. Uh, a recording of this will be distributed to all of you by the end of the week, as well as a copy of the chat, which is full of all kinds of resources and information. Dr. Raja, thank you again for your wonderful presentation. And to everyone on the call, take care and be well. <laughs>